have not had a so-called mountaintop experience in a in a long, long time. And here's the story. Uh, the last mountaintop experience I think I had, and, and I haven't had many, I was in Scotland with my family. This was about a year after I got married to, to Caroline, and we it was right around, I believe, our first anniversary. We were staying out on the west coast of Scotland on, on a tiny little uh, island called Seal Island. And I had gone out all alone, just by myself from the village. I had hiked through the heather to, to this cliff that looks out over the west, over the water, the ocean, between a smattering of different islands, and, and beyond them lies the open waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The sea mist was stinging against my cheeks, and the salt air was just everywhere. And despite it being summer, there was definitely a chill and the sun that was kicking up off the waves was making my eyes squint. But out on the horizon, sticking out of the water, just was this jagged little rock jutting up out of the waves. And they have a funny little name to them. They're called the Garbalex. And it's a scarcely habitable uh, little spot where literally centuries and centuries ago, St. Columba, who uh, was given credit for bringing Christianity to Scotland, would come out of, to this little tiny speck of, of rock sticking out of the ocean when he got tired, when he got sick of all the monks that, he, uh, that were living on Iona with him. He had built a, con, uh, a, a monastery there. And so sitting up on this ledge overlooking the ocean there in Scotland, I was hit, I was struck by, in one moment, in one instance, by the scale of nature around me watching and seeing these islands that jut out and watching the wildlife around me, hearing you know the, the animals walking through the heather around me. I got a glimpse of my own insignificance, the sheer age of the, of the place, how somehow uh, everything around me at uh, that moment was I don't, connected. Everything was touched by the holy. So there I was squinting out across the waters and and seeing this tiny little speck of land out there in the distance, the, the whole of my vision at that moment felt more focused. The whole of my vision, everything seemed to make sense in a sort of almost terrifyingly clear way. I was scared and overwhelmed, and yet at the very same time, I felt peace that I had never experienced before. And to put it bluntly, the, the person who came down that hill was not the same person who had gone up. Now, being a pastor, I've had the privilege over the course of, of my ministry of hearing other people's mountaintop experiences. For one colleague that I once worked with, it was being a young life leader nearly 30 years ago. It completely changed the trajectory of her life. And I'm surprised how often summer camps you know, especially summer camps in the mountains, come up for people. I don't know if it's something about the mountains themselves or the crisp, clean air, it being in nature. I don't know. It may, it may even be the sense of community that takes place. And just as profound are the stories that I've heard from people in, in this church here in Westfield who have helped lead the high school mission trip, for example, or who have had a spiritual experience that changed their lives maybe late at night during a talk at a men's retreat, a women's retreat, maybe sitting with some of our guests, uh, you know, with, with fish here at the church, or, you know, staying up all night around a campfire while doing, you know, Box City, a mission event that we do each year, or were doing when it was not COVID. But no matter how fleeting the moment was, there's a clear sense that when we have had what we call a mountaintop experience, that we've encountered something there that is so deeply holy, so, so sacred, that will never quite be the same again. Well, today, our time together focuses on a story that is repeated in the Gospels at least three times. It's referenced in the New Testament through some of the letters. And it's even possibly referenced in John's gospel, even though he doesn't talk about the story in obvious uh, terms. It's the transfiguration of Jesus. 
This is an event in Jesus's life where he, he goes up a mountain with some of his disciples. His appearance changed right in front of them. And, and in such a way that his full glory was on display in front of them. He, he really truly was full of the glory of God in that moment. It's as if they caught an early glimpse of his resurrected self and all the redemption that was promised in his life shows up in that instance. They don't know what to do with it. They're terrified. Well, let's hear that story now together. So six days later, and by the way, when we hear six days later, what the story is actually telling us is that what comes directly before the story of the transfiguration is Jesus basically freaking out his disciples, his followers, by asking them first to name who he really is. And Peter is the one that says that he is the Messiah. And then right after that, he tells them about how he's going to be killed and then resurrected. And that's the setup for today's story, the transfiguration. And it starts off with these words, six days later. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain, all apart, by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, as, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, because they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Well, friends, that's the long and short of the story. Matthew tells it a little differently. Luke tells it a little differently. But that's the basics of the story. It's filled with symbolism. I mean, there is this holy mountain that they have to go up, which shows up all over the Bible to show that this is where God has decided to show up. There's Elijah perhaps the most famous of all the royal prophets. There's Moses, in some ways, the, the very heartbeat of the Old Testament. And there, there's also this little scene that plays out. It's a lot like Jesus' baptism, this voice, right? The clouds come, and a voice comes from the clouds saying, this is my son. There's even a little bit of a scene that seems to follow or give a premonition of the crucifixion itself. And in this moment, all the scriptures are being pulled together into one. All of it is being wrapped up with a little bow saying this is the center of all of it. Where all the hopes of humanity, all the intention that God has for humanity, all of it is met in this one person, Jesus. And he quite literally glows from it. Peter doesn't know what to say, but he knows that somehow in this moment, he's encountered something in this moment that will leave him changed forever. Now, the poor guy has his ups and downs. He rejects Jesus later on in the Gospels. The shine of the moment doesn't really stick in the way that we might hope, but it is there. It has been profound. It did change him. And I suppose that's the first lesson of the transfiguration. There are others, but this is the first lesson of the transfiguration. And, and frankly, it's the first lesson of, of almost all of the holy moments that we have in this life. The problem is that they, they fade over time. When I reflect back on, on that day so long ago off the coast of Scotland, I know something has changed. I mean, signs of that experience are, are still very much with me. One of the guiding, I suppose you would call it one of the guiding truths of my ministry is this affirmation that the very profane of this world has actually been touched because of Jesus, has been touched with the divine. That there is nothing in existence that could ever be holy without the presence of the holy. And this everyday life, I think what it means is that Everything from our, our music, our arts, 
to even the most vile person you know, the most vile person you can imagine. It's all been claimed. It's all been touched by God. You really want to get mundane about it. If you go to my LinkedIn page, I'm not suggesting you do, but if you were to go there, one would read that I am a dad and a husband. It says I'm a fellow fool on a spiritual journey. It adds later that one of my key areas of, of interest is helping people connect to their own personal spiritual lives and how the everyday distractions of our existence can blind us from these little moments of grace that play out all around us. It goes on to say that my preaching and teaching, my mentoring, former blogging that I used to be able to do, they all center around seeing the extraordinary in the mundane and seeing the divine in the profane. It's all there. It's all there. So much of what was captured in this one fleeting moment so long ago, it's still a touchstone for how I lead church. It guides a lot of of how I even understand prayer and scripture, of how I understand how to provide care to people, how we live life, it's all there. But the power of it, the, the, the immediacy of it, has faded away a bit. And this may be one of the saddest re recurring stories that I get from people. I mean, just as I hear of people who, who talk about these, these moments that change their lives, these mountaintop experiences, I also hear of this longing to return to that moment. Over and over again, I hear these stories from people that talk about there was that time, that time where it was real for me, but this feeling of wanting to reclaim that feeling again. And even the, the temptation to see anything else as truly spiritual. What I mean by this is sometimes those mountaintop experiences can be so big that it belittles our ability, it hinders our ability to see holy moments at work around us. It all fades over time. You know, there, there's a poet, American poet, um, named Christian Wyman, and he had a spiritual awakening uh, several years ago during cancer treatment. And he talks about this experience of his in a book called My Bright Abyss. And, and he, he has this to say. I'm, I'm going to read it directly from his book, so forgive me. But he says, What you must realize, what you must even come to praise, is the fact that there is no right way that is going to become apparent to you once and for all. The most blinding illumination that strikes and perhaps radically changes your life will be so attenuated and obscured by doubts and dailiness that you may one day come to suspect the truth of that moment at all. The calling that seemed so clear will be lost in echoes of questionings and indecision. <laughs> the church that seemed to save you will fester with egos, complacencies, banalities, the deepest love of your life will work itself like a thorn in your heart until all you can think of is plucking it out. Wisdom is accepting the truth of this. Courage is persisting with life in spite of it. And faith is finding yourself in the deepest part of your soul in the very heart of who you are, moved to praise it. Mm. This image, this raw power of the experience, you know, has a way of, of being diluted. You have this mountaintop experience, and with all of that immense power over your life, and Christian seems to say that it is diluted away amid the wash of daily living. We even get to this place where we may be too embarrassed to mention the moment in public, doubting that it should have 
it had any power over us the way it once did. It may actually come to a point where we doubt the experience itself because it's faded over time. I mean, beyond the mountaintop lies a life of, of trying to sort it out, to live with it, to, to seeking to, to hold it, whatever it may be. Again, it could be the camp experiences, the meeting of a loved one for the first time. Whatever that spark, that mountaintop experience that taught you in the most visceral way of what holy means, the work is trying to sort it out and live this life beyond it after the shine has worn off. It's a, a learning to live the experience of the mountaintop in a way that, that leads us to see God in the millions of little moments that we trudge through daily. I suppose that this, perhaps more than anything, is a lesson that Jesus helps us to learn. Even now, even today, we seek the holy. We yearn for the big sweeping moments that, that, that leave us in awe. But we meet God. We meet God, not in a bolt of lightning, but instead in this Middle Eastern man who was a, a builder and an itinerant preacher who lived 2,000 years ago. I mean, the transfiguration carries us to a place that bumps up against the supernatural, leaves us second-guessing everything that we knew, everything that we thought possible, helping us see Jesus in a way he had never been seen before, but was only the beginning of what we've come to know. And in our personal lives, we've either had or seek to find moments that fill us with that same level of, of awe and wonder. So I suppose the question, I suppose the question really to leave us with today is, what do we carry with us back down the mountain once we've had the experience? The, do we carry with us the bigness of that moment? Or a lesson that teaches us to see that same miracle in all of life? 